Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to our DV Talks today. I'm Danielle Ulner, Ulner, Managing Director and Partner at BCG Digital Ventures, the corporate innovation and business building arm of the Boston Consulting Group. We're excited to have a very special guest with us today, Chris Darby, a former DV colleague and now the CTO and co-founder of EV Energy a business on a mission to accelerate decarbonization in the transport sector by making electric vehicle charging simple, green, and low cost. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris, and great to see you again. So firstly, tell us a little bit about your background and your journey to set up EV Energy. Sure. Uh, well, um, yeah, firstly, thanks so much for, for inviting me back. It's great to be chatting with uh, some BCG and DV colleagues again. Um, I the, the the story of EV Energy uh, actually starts at at uh, BCG. So uh, my my colleague and co-founder Nick Woolley, um, also a B ex BCG consultant, we worked together on a on a very long due diligence, which was a very intense way of learning uh, someone's working style and getting to know someone, which was a fantastic. Um, starting point for us. Um, and that was while I was at BCG um, before I moved into digital ventures. So spent a bit of time in digital ventures and got to work on all these exciting things, especially in the energy sector. Um, and it was after about two years there that I ended up on jury duty. And I don't know what jury duty, <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has been on jury duty, but you get a lot of time to think and reflect and um, figure out where you're at in your life. And um, I, I was probably about four years out of uh, university from my engineering degree. And I'd always wanted to start a startup and spent two years at BCG learning strategy and how to run a business and all these great things. Two more years of digital ventures learning about products. And it seemed like the right time. And around this time, Nick reconnected with me and said, hey, let's go get coffee. And so we're sitting, having coffee, eating our eggs at breakfast. And, uh, and he says, I've got this great idea. Electric vehicles are coming. They're going to cause all these challenges for the distribution system operators. And I said, whoa, 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 Nick. I don't know what a distribution system operator is. My mum certainly doesn't know what a distribution system operator is. This sounds like a cool idea, but it's got to work for real people. So, so that's really where the idea for, for, um, for EV Energy came from, um, was those conversations. Um, and, and as you said, our mission is to make charging EVs simpler, cheaper, and greener for everyone. So that means you and me, that means my mum, uh, that means the distribution system networks as well. And all the other people involved in the production and and, uh, and retail of energy, but also for the planet. Um, and and what EV Energy does is it enables people to save hundreds of pounds on their energy bill in the UK and hundreds of euros in Europe, and also save twenty to thirty percent of the carbon emissions from charging their electric car too. So it's this logical end to my journey of I want to do a startup, go get those fantastic building blocks from BCG and Digital Ventures. And then the opportunity arose and it was it was really yeah, just some great timing about three years ago. That's an awesome story, Chris. I've met dozens of entrepreneurs over my career and I can't recall one referring to jury duty as helping them. <laughs> idea. So you're, you're the first. Uh, so, so let's move on. So at Digital Ventures, as, as you well know, our battle-tested approach to venture building is to start by looking at customer frictions and user needs. And then we overlay things like technical trends and industry trends to help us identify those rich opportunities so we can go ahead and disrupt the status quo. So tell us a bit about the dynamics of the electric vehicle industry and how you identified this specific opportunity to go ahead and, and launch your business. Yeah, so so when when Nick was talking to me about the distribution system operators and the networks, um, yeah, frankly, I didn't really know what was going on there. I knew I knew elements of the energy system, but not really the the the, the challenges they were facing at the coalface. And and the challenge is is driven by the uptake of EVs. And so as more EVs come onto the grid, it creates problems for the grid. Um, and, and that's really the one of the the market conditions. But let's take a step back and think about the, the bigger picture. So. Um, really, the, the, the crisis we're facing is climate change. Um, it's undeniably affecting all of us. We can see it in the news headlines every day. Um, it's a real challenge we've got to tackle as humanity. Um, and uh, Horst Rittle and, and Melvin Weber back in the 70s identified these group of problems called wicked problems. Um, and this was really crystallized for me um, by a chap called Paul Allen um, in the Zero Carbon Britain report. And a, a wicked problem is a problem that sort of self-perpetuates. Um, and 
they, they as climate change gets worse, as the climate warms up, the ice melts, more carbon dioxide is released, uh, and uh, people need to use their air conditioning more and all these other things that reinforce this problem and make it worse and worse and worse. Um, and secondly, the other side of a wicked problem is it, there's, there's a moral obligation to solve the problem and to solve it right first time. It's not like in mathematics where you can sort of try 17 different ways and find, okay, great, we found the optimal solution. There's no way for us to run. We don't have another planet to run this experiment on, right? We've got to solve this. We've got to solve it now. Um, and we've got to make sure we, we find the best or one of the best solutions. So that inspired us to, to also think about other solutions to, to wicked problems. And I think solar is a fantastic example of this. Um, and, and the problem of solar was that it's a very expensive technology back in the 70s when it was launched. People were paying $70 per watt of, of, of generation capacity. Compared to today, we're down to 20 cents per watt, which means it's no longer the preserve of uh, satellites. It's on everyone's rooftop in California, and it's powering uh, 20, 30% of the grid in the UK as well on, on any given day. Um, and this cost efficiency has sort of been combined with heavy investment. So in 2020, over 150 billion was invested in solar projects worldwide. And 99% of new generation built in the US um, in the last year was renewable which given the political climate is, is fantastic. It clearly shows there's a strong economic driver here as well, not just a moral argument. So thinking about transportation and climate change and the, and the climate crisis, the single largest individual contributor to the CO2 emissions in the UK is transportation, which makes up about a quarter of our uh, CO2 emissions. And from a political perspective, the government announced back in April, they want to cut this by 80%. Um, by 2035. So this is a great start. We've got the political will, we've got the bigger kind of clear problem statement, uh, but the planet needs fixed, <laughs> otherwise we're in big trouble. And so we're, this is the first step on the way to creating our wicked solution to climate change. So EVs is sort of one of the possible solutions. And why are we looking at EVs and not, uh, not another different way of doing this? Well, this is where that problem with the distribution system operators comes into play. The number of EVs on the road, um, over 8 million now actually on the road worldwide, is starting to cause problems for, for other people in, in, the, in the ecosystem, starting to cause problems for energy generators and people who need to maintain power lines and things like that. Um, and and in, the, in Europe especially, we're seeing a big drive with 1 million of those vehicles um, being in Europe, in, or at least by the end of this year it will be. And the revenues from this space as well, this is where it gets quite interesting. 36 billion euros by 2030 will be spent on fueling electric cars. So we've got this climate context, we've got a problem for, for corporates, we've got people willing to pay some money, and we've got a massive value pool to be playing in. Um, and there are so many vehicles available for users to choose from as well. So another thing that's just sort of coming to, to the right point now is you've got, the, uh, you've got nearly 70 different models of vehicles available in Europe, um, and much like solar prices, these are falling as well. You're seeing not the $100,000 Tesla from 2010, but you're now seeing the twenty to 30,000 uh, pounds MG or Renault vehicle on the road in the UK that's much, much more affordable. So thinking back to those DV frameworks, we've got, the, the, we've got fantastic macroeconomic conditions for this. Um, the missing piece is the customer, right? The friction for the customer. And so that's what that was really where our research focused is once we proved other market risks, we proved the technical ability to do this. We then went looking for the customer and, and, and making sure that this problem really existed for them was a real pain that they needed solving. Um, and I don't know uh, if any of the folks watching this own an EV, but owning an EV is fantastic, right? Everything about it is brilliant. The car maybe even drives itself. It's shiny. It's new. It's got all the latest technology. You just have to plug the damn thing in, which is the problem, right? So. Um, we realize that this is a, a big problem. It's painful in many different ways because you've got concerns about, will I find somewhere to charge my car when I'm on the go? What's the right energy plan to be on at home? Uh, what if I run out of energy on the road? How am I going to do this road trip? And we sort of spoke with lots of customers, frankly, and, and identified a few interesting behaviors um, on what happens when they initially get a vehicle and then as that evolves over time. And that's really what drove us to, to, to attack this uh, problem space uh, with EV Energy as a solution. That's great, Chris. Thank you. And I'm glad you, you made reference to 
the complexity of the ecosystem. And let's come back to that in, in a moment. And this conversation actually comes hot on the heels of a major announcement about the launch of BCG Green Ventures. So this is a new team and offering under BCG Digital Ventures, which will focus focus on closing the innovation gap in new green technologies. And we know that addressing climate change means constructing these ecosystems that go beyond isolated silos where governments, corporates, NGOs, and entrepreneurs like you are all working together towards that same goal, that wicked problem that, that you spoke about. So how do you play into those ecosystems and who has the right to play and, and win in these spaces? Well, we, um, I mean, one of our values uh, as, as, a, as a company is um, to find the win-win wins. And what we mean by that is those, life is not a zero-sum game. It's very rarely a zero-sum game for sure. And finding those places where multiple parties can do better out of this uh, means that you can engage the whole ecosystem and generally end up with a better outcome. Um, so yes, there's all the corporations who are involved in this or government entities, depending on your regulations in your market for energy. We've got NGOs who are trying to influence policy, drive the adoption of EVs, trying to reduce the dependency on fossil fuels. And you've got startups like us um, who are trying to connect all the dots. Um, and, and we see this as, a, as I said, a win-win-win for everyone. So we're winning for the grid by reducing the need for infrastructure investment. We're winning, winning for energy retailers by enabling them to uh, create a group of loyal customers um, with higher energy demands, by the way, um, and making them cheaper to serve. So that's a whole set of wins in itself. Um, we're winning for society by using more renewables when we can and taking load off the grid um, when, it's, uh, when it's full of, of, of fossil fuel power. And finally, winning for the customer, saving them money, solving that charging problem, and making them feel good about driving green as well. So how does this connect with, with, with other corporates? Well, I think that corporates can do more and they must do more to be part of this ecosystem. Um, and it's not just about the internal stuff. So it's not just about turning the lights off or uh, thinking about the direct carbon footprint of the organization. This is a great opportunity to innovate with how corporations interact with the rest of the world, especially given the way that we've evolved our ways of working over the past um, 12 months. I mean, we're talking on Zoom today, which we barely knew about uh, three years ago. So, so that's a fundamental shift. And the carbon impact of, of us not jumping on a plane to somewhere to, to do this face to face um, is, is a fantastic saving. Um, but we can do more. So from a strategic level, thinking about different scenarios is a really good tool. Um, we were using it at Digital Ventures um, to help companies future proof themselves, not just against climate change, but against all the other forces that operate. So what are the catastrophic scenarios? What, how will your business survive in 20 years if temperatures and oceans rise? But also there's, there's opportunistic ones. So what can your organization look like in a world with no carbon emissions? Or could we make our product carbon negative or our company carbon negative so we actually have a positive impact on, on climate change? Um, I think about one of the scenarios we had, the petrolless driverless, driverless vehicle, vehicle of 2050. Uh, if you look at like 2025 now feels like a much more reasonable time horizon for that. So it's important to invest in these things, even if they do feel a little bit um, futuristic, because um, these things change very quickly. Um, and there's other ways you can engage. So maybe you don't want to shift your entire organization strategy, or maybe that's beyond your gift. Um, thinking about engaging with startups in different ways. So in using their products, frankly, that's, I mean, I'd love it. If that happened, we'd love to sell you some smart charging for sure. Um, but also you can, you can engage by investing in startups. So I'm um, thinking about where your, uh, what your treasury strategy is around venture capital. Is it with ESG focused VCs? Um, those are the people who are really making this journey possible and easier for, for startups like mine and other innovators. Um, and then going back to the operational perspective, those flights you're not taking, what about the supply chains you operate in? Are they sustainable? Are you able to influence, thinking about influence the people you buy from, the people you sell to, um, to be more sustainable? Because whilst it might cost you a couple of cents, it could actually extend the lifetime of your business by extending the lifetime of the planet, right? So this stuff is important. Um, and the long-term societal good will definitely pay off more than those couple of cents you'll save here and there. 
we we are in strong alignment on on that. That's for sure. Um, and in fact, many of the things you just referenced are things that we talk about with our our clients every day. So you know, as as you just discussed, there's a lot of of challenges and massive opportunities here. But EVs are not without their critics. And so, how do you address the the doubters out there? And what are some of the things you, you have to say to those who may be listening today? Yeah, I mean. There is there is a utopian world in which we don't need any carbon emissions at all. And in many ways, I'd love to live in that world. Um, uh, but also, um, we have to be pragmatic. I think we should be reducing our dependency on, on, um, on, on, on fossil fuels in all the ways that we can. We should be walking more. We should be using active transportation. We should be using public transportation where we can. All these things are things we should do. But fundamentally, I don't think we're going to get away from the personal um, vehicle for a few years yet, right? So um, I'm hoping I'm not putting a lifetime on my business here, but I think we've got at least 20 or 30 years, so we should be good. So the, I guess the two challenges we normally get are, is this really, well, first of all, can I do the driving I need to do in an electric car or can I just not give up my petrol car today? And then secondly, is this really greener or cheaper or cleaner than, than what I'm already doing today? So um, I guess that first question, doing the driving you need to do, well, I'm obviously going to say yes, because I'm a strong EV advocate, but it's not quite as simple as that. So uh, the first challenge that people tend to hit up against is looking at the range of those vehicles. Um, it used to be kind of 150, 200, 250. We're now in the worlds of 300, 350 mile vehicles. So a lot of that has been met by bridging the technology gap, but we can't all afford those super expensive vehicles. And I think we need to do a bit of a reality check, which is that the average driver in Europe is doing about 30 miles a day. So it's a bit less than our friends over in the US, about 50. We're doing about 30 miles a day. So actually, a 150-mile range vehicle is plenty for us to commute. It's just those occasional road trips. Um, now, But this fear is, is genuine, real, and acute, right? This is a thing that people viscerally feel, and therefore they can't part with their cash to buy a new EV. But I think that it's a, about thinking about the way you interact with transportation. And, and first of all, Maybe that 150 mile vehicle is fine for you. You can do all your pottering around, take the kids to school, whatever it is, do your local shop. If you need to go on a long trip, use public transportation and that works fine for you. If you're really set on driving, uh, doing those road trips, and again, this is a, a cultural thing in the US, less so in, in Europe and the UK, certainly in the UK, it's not that big of a place. So, um, but, but it is possible to do those road trips. And the, the technology gap that's being bridged there is around charging. So even if you say my vehicle's only got 200 mile range, 250 mile range, most people's bladders have a similar range. So you'll find yourself stopping after a few hours driving, popping to the loo, grabbing a coffee. By the time you're back in your car, that's about 15, 20 minutes gone. Now you don't really recognize this when you're doing it because it all happens in real time, feels quite quick. Um, that 15, 20 minutes is enough to charge a lot of vehicles for another 100, 150, 200 miles. Um, and that technology is getting better day by day. So really, I think that problem is a short-term one that's being solved. Um, even where that, that gap isn't quite met. And then around the green cleanness, yes, EVs are greener, fundamentally. The embedded carbon in manufacture is very, very similar to that of an internal combustion engine, um, but the tailpipe emissions are zero. So if, if nothing else, you've taken all the pollution out of the, uh, out of the cities um, and pushed it back into the grid, um, which is solving half the problem, right? We've moved the problem somewhere else now. But if you factor in the typical fuel mix of a European energy grid, um, within about four years, you've paid off your carbon debt for buying this vehicle versus buying a petrol vehicle. And every year, the grid gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. So this is a fantastic example of a wicked solution. Invest in the battery today, and you can keep using that battery as the grid gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that EVs last longer, typically, is what we've seen. So you can find, um, in fact, I implore you all to go on Autotrader on eBay, go buy yourself a secondhand Tesla. Um, there or, or any other, I mean, any other secondhand EV, they've got fantastic range still for the most part. Uh, and they, they're doing hundreds of thousands of miles in these vehicles without showing any real kind of limitations on their technology. I think, I think 250,000, 300,000, maybe you're, you're pushing your luck a bit, but compare that to a petrol car at hundred thousand miles, you're thinking about a new engine and all this other stuff. So really, I think on two aspects, number one, the lifetime of the, 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 the asset. And secondly, the fuel mix changing over time, you're going to be cleaner and greener going EV. Quite, 
a compelling uh, pitch there, Chris. Thank you. And I love talking uh, all things decarbonization and sustainability with you today. And while we have been chatting, we've had a few questions um, come in from our studio audience. So why don't I, I take a look and see what's come in and I'll throw some of those at you if that's all right. Sure. All right, so question one. How did your time at BCG and DB prepare you um, and your co-founder for setting up EV Energy? Yeah, I, great question. Um, I, I think there are a few, uh, there are a few things from 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 both BCG and DB that really helped us. So, um, DB's approach to to finding the problems and the relentless focus on those. Uh, a lot of the design thinking that I begged, borrow and stole from our design expertise um, and, and UX experts and all the user research I sat in on and, and some of which I, I helped with fundamentally gives you a different perspective. I, in one word, it's empathy and really understanding how to listen to people and not try and force fit your solution to their problem is, is a really important one. I think on the, uh, on the BCG side, um, there are a lot of great things about the way about internally how the organization operates. Um, values are very important at BCG and they're incredibly important for, for us at EV Energy as well. Um, and, and that um, importance of values as an organization enables people to do their best work because it enables them to go, okay, I don't need direction on exactly what I'm doing here. I can lean on a framework that will support me. It's, it's intellectually challenging sometimes. You have to really engage your brain and say, right, I can't just... This value on its own doesn't answer my question. I've got to think, um, but it, it does set you up to, to think in those ways. And, and finally, I mean, meeting my co-founder, Nick, if we hadn't been on that due diligence together all those years ago, then EV Energy would, ne would not quite be what it is today, for sure. That's great. And, and yes, the, the customer empathy is, is so, so important. And it's always so crazy when you speak to people who are launching something and they don't spend enough time in market because they just think that they're the customer. But we all know that you are not necessarily the, the customer. So the second question that's come in from the audience, and I, I suspect we have some budding entrepreneurs out there who are thinking about launching their, their own startups, uh, is what have been some of the biggest challenges you faced with setting up an energy-related startup? Yeah, it's, uh, we're, we're sort of at a it's a question we get asked a lot and we're sort of at a um uh an intersection of of a few challenges here if you if you uh, wanted to to go into a market where your sales cycle was any slower you'd be hard pushed to find one than energy automotive local government it's essentially what we're saying to unfortunately so the sales cycle is incredibly challenging we've had to be quite um smart about the the way in which we go about this it's very hard to wait for a contract to come through you've got to be scrappy you've got to be willing to chuck something together try it out with some users even if you're not getting paid for it um and and certainly the first sort of year or so uh we the the the, the deals we really closed with utilities were small entrepreneurial utilities who are thinking the same as us so the uk was a fantastic market to start in with nearly 100 different energy retailers lots of them startups that was fantastic markets like the US, much more challenging, um, because aside from Texas, which is a bit of an oddball, highly regulated space, lots of incumbents that have been there for years, investor-owned utilities, standard corporate pro, uh, sort of um, procurement cycles, and uh, also a lot of this stuff goes to the public utilities commissions, and it's a whole different world. So I guess that the the challenge we faced is understanding that sales cycle and, and picking where to, to accelerate it. And my advice would be, look for where you can find those market benefits, any structural benefits you can find um, for your idea, your innovation, your startup, go to those markets, even if it's a, a, a not necessarily the one you're most comfortable with, because it will enable you to prove that traction, prove that product market fit, rather than saying, oh, I've got to wait 12 months for this to go to the PUC or something. Thanks, Chris. And, and apologies to anyone from Texas who's listening in today. <laughs> And as someone who, who loves to invest in early stage companies and back strong founders like, like you, I'm always curious about use of proceeds from fundraising rounds. So someone has asked what you will use your Series A funding for, and if you can tell us more about that. Yeah, so um, we closed an 8.8 .8 million US dollar funding round a few weeks back, um, led by uh, Energy Impact Partners, um, which we're really excited about. Um, uh, I've been 
I'm, I'm not like a, a VC nerd. I know some founders are like, oh, these are the VCs, this is what we want. But I've known about EIP for quite some time through um, uh, some podcasts and so on, some of their, some of their partners chat on those. And, and the, uh, the alignment has been fantastic um, with them. And their limited partners are all energy automotive corporations. And this kind of synergy between um, corporate capital, traditional venture capital, fantastic um, alignment for us and, and really what we would think of as smart money. So we're really, really excited to have them on board. We actually had our last board meeting, or well, first board meeting on Friday last week, which was a really good discussion. So feeling very positive about it. Um, but yes, VC money is not no strings attached. We have to do some great things with it. And what we're, um, what we're hoping to do is the product market fit in the UK is, is pretty strong. Um, but we we want to we want to grow that. So there's an investment in in growing the user base in the UK, and that's across unlocking new vehicles, new chargers, but also frankly just classic marketing spent. Um, and then in parallel, we we want to be able to access other markets. So um, we're working with some customers out in in the US. Um, we are hopefully going to be doing some more stuff in Texas as well. Despite its challenges, it's a good place to be, um, and also in Germany as well. So. Um, We'll be launching propositions. I mean, we already have some folks live in California with Silicon Valley Clean Energy. Uh, we've got um, one of the best EV tariffs in the UK with Eon Next um, already live and more coming in, uh, in other places in the US, in Germany and the rest of the world as well. That's amazing, Chris. We can't wait to see how the story uh, unfolds over the coming um years. So it looks like that is all we've got time for today. So before we wrap up, is there anything else you, you'd like to add in terms of closing remarks? Well, I'm just really, really um, excited to be to be invited back to, to chat with you, Danielle. It's, um, it's been a long while since um, uh, I've been in a DV office, and uh, hopefully we get to meet up in person over a coffee sometime, and, uh, and you can tell me how it's all evolved. Um, I mean, I'm particularly excited about Green Ventures. Um, I think it's a logical extension to uh, the, the, the core BCG values. Uh, it plays into that social impact and, and proving the art of the possible. What can be done today by corporations to really uh, pave the way for tomorrow? Um, and I guess my final thought is if you are an EV driver um, or you happen to run a utility company, get in touch. Uh, but if you are an EV driver, uh, you can head to our website, ev.energy, and uh, download our app. And uh, we can hopefully save you some money on your energy bill and certainly save the planet. That's great. I, I feel like we should offer some discount codes like another another <laughs> podcast here. <laughs> Maybe for next time. And de definitely coffee is, is on me. We would love to show you um, and any listeners out there our, our new amazing office space um, on Charlotte Street that we're moving into. So it has been an absolute pleasure reconnecting with you today, Chris. And thank you to everyone else who has tuned in. Thank you, everyone. And hope to chat again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.